Hey guys. Oh, so many familiar faces. Love this. Okay, I'm going to mute myself and just pause the pause the mic to Dylan. Sure. Um, well, thank you all for being here. Um, uh, this is my first inner intellect event, and so it's it's great to meet all of you. And and uh, I've been admirer of, of Anna's work for a long time, and I'm excited we get to do this. Um, so, uh, as I understand is the tradition here, the hope is is to make this less of of a panel with observers and more of of a a large panel of all of us discussing. So I think. Uh, I'll introduce you to Noah and Kim, uh, who are our experts, and uh, we'll talk a bit about uh, sort of uh, what an abundance agenda looks like, and then open the floor. and And I'm excited to hear any questions you all have. Um, so yeah, so this conversation kind of came together uh, as an outgrowth of some intellectual trends that that Anna and I and uh, Noah and Kim have been noticing, and and to some degree been a part of. Um, one is just sort of general scl sclerosis when it comes to the built environment. And that was something there that uh, there was a lot of discussion about in the context of housing markets and, and land use regulation. But also, I think there's been growing awareness that there are, are, uh, there are barriers to building out green energy. Um, you had a, a transmission line from Quebec of clean hydrofuel that was going to go through Maine and Maine killed it. Uh, using land use regulation. I think the pandemic reminded us that uh, our our productive capacity is much more fragile than we thought it was. Um, and uh, just in time manufacturing has many advantages, but it can also lead to moments of great scarcity as, as we've all experienced. And I think this has culminated in a few different movements. One is sort of the progress studies movement that you see from, from organizations like Roots of Progress or, or the Institute of Progress. Uh, you saw this um, pre-pandemic or um, uh, at least early in the pandemic with the like, let's build something uh, manifesto that Mark Andreessen put out. Uh, you And more generally, there just seems to be a, a mood around a a politics that tries to get rid of, of constraints causing widespread scarcity um, and doing that in a broadly egalitarian way. Um, Janet Yellen has talked about supply side progressivism as, as one way to think about this, um, but I think it's also bigger and, and not necessarily only the province of the left and also maybe a lot harder than uh, a lot of us think it could be. Um, it's not lost to me that, that Mark Andreessen wrote that whole essay and then Andreessen Horowitz's big push has been NFTs, which are uh, not physical and not <laughs> things to build in the world. And you know, it, it turns out to be hard to pivot toward building physical, real things out there. Um, so uh, you've you've probably encountered both of our panelists before. Um, I just to give background on myself, I'm a reporter at Vox. I've been there for about eight years. Uh, I'm interested in in the intersection of politics and the economy and sort of uh, ideas about both and how those ideas translate into to, um, actual action. And some of the better ideas I've, I've heard in recent years come from Noah and Kim. Uh, Kim, uh, Kim Cutler, like, like me, is a, a journalist by background um, and is now a, a VC at uh, Initialized. Uh, her piece on the origins of the Silicon Valley housing crisis for TechCrunch is I think like one of the single best sort of pieces of online journalism I've ever read or just journalism full stop. Um, anyone who's at all interested in that topic should go and read it. Um, but just has been a consistently thoughtful thinker on, on what it means to sort of to build uh, the barriers um, and uh, what it would look like to, to have a more aggressive sort of dynamic uh, uh, economic future. Um, Noah is, uh, uh, did not used to be in our, our tribe of journalists, but has, has wriggled his way in to some degree. Uh, so I, I started reading Noah when he was a grad student in economics, and then when he was a, a professor, he has uh, adopted the life of a full-time poster now, um, and you can read him on his Substack uh, uh, and, and on his, his very well-followed Twitter, uh, where you can also see many photos of his, his wonderful bunnies. Um, so to kick things off, um, uh, I wanted to ask each of you, um, we're restructuring this around the idea of an abundance agenda, and there are a lot of different terms for what that could mean. 
Um, but uh, maybe each of you could talk a bit about how you conceptualize what such an agenda would look like, or even if, if you think that's a useful way to frame these issues, or if this, this new framing is, uh, is limited in some ways. So maybe we can start with Noah and then, then get Kim's thoughts. Um, unmute Noah. The first step in the abundance agenda is to unmute. Um, <laughs> so, all right, so yeah, you're, <laughs> carrot fairy bunny, exactly. Um, that's right. So I, I think you you gave a pretty good overview, especially of the the kind of multiple branches of this thing. I think um, where we've really seen a lot of movement on this is from people in the Biden administration. You see Janet Yellen talking about this. You see, um, uh, you know, the Biden administration coming out with all these these sort of big industrial policy proposals, which ultimately come from the Elizabeth Warren campaign. Uh, I liked the Elizabeth Warren campaign a lot before Elizabeth Warren pivoted from talking about sort of, you know, abundant stuff to talking more about uh, price controls, which are going to sort of do the opposite of that. But um, but I think that you've seen this interest sort of in the, I don't know what you'd call it, like center left progressive circles uh, at, at, at building more stuff. And I think, you know, the, the, the housing shortage was part of that, but I think just, um, um, yeah, you know, and, and, and worries about healthcare and things like that. And so, so I think you've seen on, on the left political side that, on the on the sort of techno libertarian side, you've seen a lot of people who think that the problem is not so much that government's not making a big push to build stuff. The 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 problem is more that government's getting in the way, uh, you know, over regulation things like that. Uh, now, where does the truth lie? Of course, the truth is both. The truth is that government could do more things to build things on its own, and government could also, uh, you know, do more things to allow the private sector to more effectively build things often the same exact thing. So of course, we all, the housing is the obvious example here. We all know about massive, uh, you know, zoning regulation, many other regulations, environmental reviews and, um, you know, appeals and other stuff, parking minimums that prevent housing from being built. And, um, but also it's equally true that the government owns a lot of land and the government could build housing on a lot of that land. And so you have situations where, uh, you know, this, this um, in, in pretty much every, every thing we'd like more of, there's really not much, there's really not nearly as much conflict as people think between the idea of have government do more and have government do less. It's simply have government do more of some things and less of other things. The, and, and so I've, I've been trying to push people toward getting beyond this, this sort of Ronald Reagan era dichotomy between the idea of government do more or government do less, more government versus less government. We need to think instead of methods, we need to think more about goals. You know, I, of course, in like the 90s and 2000s, there were all these people who, you know, tried to chart a middle way, a third, third way and say, okay, instead of big or small government, we need smart, effective government. That's not wrong, but it's not inspiring either. And so I think that what we need is just more stuff and whatever policies get us the more stuff we need to do that. And I think that the, where that really comes from is the New Deal. And the New Deal can, you know, was about two thirds, in my opinion, was about two thirds good stuff and one third stupid. And ultimately ended up being good, but made a lot of missteps. And, and the, the phrase here was, um, was bold, persistent experimentation. Uh, you know, obviously there was a lot of over-regulation of things, but the New Deal even cut regulation in some, in some areas. Uh, so I think the New Deal gives us the right framework for thinking about how we have to go about it. We have to, you know, in the New Deal, the idea was get people back to work. That was it. Get people back to work. That was the goal. And of course, that sort of morphed into, you know, World War II era economic planning, where the goal is just beat the axis. But, you know, there was a, a big goal. And then it's like, okay, well, what could we do to achieve that goal? And so I think that the abundance agenda, I'd like to see it focus on, is goals over methods. And when I say goals, I, re I really just mean the things we want abundance of. We need to just make a list of the things we wish we had more of, right? We wish we had more housing. Um, you know, we wish we had more high paying jobs. <laughs> that's, um, 
it sounds silly and, and generic, but of course that you know was the New Deal too. I guess uh, you know we we wish we had I don't know cheaper healthcare. Um, we you know we have the we wish we had uh, you know better trains. They, I could go on. And so these are the the things we want, the abundance of things that we want. And then we work backwards. We say, okay, that's what we want. Now, what can we do to get those things? And that's that sounds again incredibly simplistic. And but then you talk to all these very smart people, and they immediately start talking about, you know, whether about methods, about regulation versus you know cutting re more regulation versus less regulation. About you know, well, you don't want to have the government get involved in blah blah blah. I think that we need to be agnostic about how we get to these goals and we need to focus on the goals and what we want these things to look like. We haven't thought enough about what we want the cities of the future to look like, what we want the jobs of the future to look like, what we want sort of the, the social relations of the future to look like. And, um, and so, yeah, so, so method agnostic focus on goals, I would say is my like sort of number one priority. I'll stop there because I might be running off. No, no, we love it. That that sets us up well, I think. Um, Kim, uh, do you broadly sort of share Noah's sort of vision of what this looked like, or or do you do you approach this a bit differently? Um, I I I do. I mean, I feel like I had been working on this issue for like ten years before it had a name. Um, you know, in terms of my housing stuff, starting ten years, and I, like I didn't just. I wasn't just a writer or journalist about it. I ended up being very involved in it and I'm on the, you know, on the board of California EMB, which has passed six state laws to make it easier to build housing in California. So I like I went from writing about it to actually like, how do we do the legislative sausage to actually mm -hmm. make it happen rather than talking about it as a pie in the sky idea. Um, in general, I guess the way I'd summarize it is, you know, for a long time the Democratic Party has focused on demand side support. And I think in some sense, in some ways, demand side support can be a good thing, particularly like when, you know, one reason you'd use it is obviously for the sake of equity so that people, you know, lesser means have access to the same goods and services that people like, like healthcare or like college education. Um, so that, I mean, that makes sense. I think another place where, you know, demand side solutions make sense is when, you know, our, you know, our economic, particularly when it comes to housing, um, the government has a role to play in counter cyclical behavior. So like the Fed creates, the Fed, you know, enables cycles of housing to exist. And then there's lots of building. And then when the cycle turns, it turns as it is now, everything shuts down. And then like construction shuts down, mortgages shut down, all this kind of stuff that shuts down. And so like, um, you know, having a government actor you know, support um, the supply side on the downside of the cycle would be really helpful. Um, but that said, like, obviously, there's been a lot of, there's a, been a lot of unintended consequences that we've seen from, from demand side solutions over the last many, many decades. Um, you know, like, if we think about, um, you know, government loans for higher education and how, you know, two thirds of the, every dollar simply perhaps feeds into just higher tuition rather than having like, and that impact of more people having access to higher education that qualifies them for the job, uh, the economy, like that, that's an issue. Um, and I also think just like in a larger sense, if you look at American history, I think the reason that the American government is just generally more focused on the demand side is because it's like, it's just easier. It's easy. I think it's easier to do. There was like a book I read a couple years ago by Sarah Quinn called American Bonds, called How Credit Markets Shaped a Nation. It was really interesting to talk about how like, credit instruments and lending was just a much more subterranean, like, you know, more sub, you know, like secret way of subsidizing demand that was less contentious because it didn't involve like fighting over direct outlays in a very transparent politicized manner. Um, so I think there are reasons that we've, we've done that in the past. Um, I think the supply side is just much harder. It's actually, cause every industry is so different. Um, if you were to ask me, what we could do to, you know, incre actually increase the supply of housing versus increase the supply of, um, you know, college degrees or medical degree. Like they're just all super different per industry, and they require, I think, a lot of really, like, tangible, hands-on knowledge of the inside of an industry that, like a, you know, like a government bureaucrat isn't necessarily going to have. Um, I would also say, like. 
I've done a lot of stuff on the investing side for, for kind of supply side set of solutions. I've invested in, you know, accessory dwelling unit companies that take advantage of the prefab supply um, in pre prefab factory supply in the United States. I've done stuff um, on, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I've, I've done, we've done basically many, many different supply side solutions. Like I've done stuff in like, there's another company I'm in called Career Karma, which is all about like um, vocational job you know, training matching to, to like for tens of thousands of job seekers, you want to level up from blue skilled work to, to white collar work. Um, and I don't know, it's just like, I think about the comment that you made a lot, Dylan, which is like, why did, why did this essay get written? And then it's, you know, NFTs. And I mean, having seen it on the investing side, it's like, you know, it's, it's at the end of the day, if you compare two companies and frankly, like supply sided to companies for things that we like actually need more of often involve like physical goods and like the, you know, the margins on each unit are just so much lower than they are on an, on an NFT. And so if you kind of compare two businesses without knowing, you know, what they're making or what they're, you know, what they're doing, if you compare a 20% margin business that's growing, you know, three or four X year over year versus like, a different business that has like 90, 90% 90 plus margins and went from, you know, like $5 million to $300 million in sales year over year. Like, obviously the other one is a better from a pure investment standpoint, going to look like on paper, a better business. And so like all the capital is going to flood there versus the first one. And so, I mean, I, that's the dynamic that I see in the venture market, which is like, you know, these things can be profitable, but they're just not going to be as profitable as like pure software or kind of crypto companies and that's just sort of the fundamental nature of the business um i don't know i'll, I'll stop there also no that's great and I, I i definitely want to hear more about sort of thinking about this from a venture perspective since um i think that's a mindset that it's uh people people on the outside looking in they sometimes find it hard to get into but um vivek uh you had a, a question about um about, about the new deal. I don't know if this is too much of a tangent, but if, did you want to expand on that and uh, and ask Noah? Oh, you want me to? Wait, oh, oh, I was just asking Vivek like, if you wanted to expand on his question. If you don't want to, that's fine. No, this is, uh, no um, I was just interested in uh, if there was a link or or, or, um, or reference to you know Noah's assertion about the new deal, uh, You know what he liked and what he didn't like, uh, but two, two thirds are really good. Uh, if there's any um, references that we, we can look into that so we can do just the good stuff in uh, in the future, uh, would be interested in that. That's all. Sure. Although, you know, of course, we're facing different problems and have different tools at our disposal. So, of course, the, the solutions are not going to look just like the New Deal. Um, but I think that the, the parts of the New Deal that really worked were getting off the gold standard, um, sort of uh, rescuing the banks was very effective. And those were the two sort of crisis management things. Uh, public works infrastructure turned out to be really effective. Um, we didn't do nearly enough of it uh, to, to give everyone the jobs they needed, but uh, we, did, we did quite a lot of it and got a lot of useful, very good uh, long-term stuff from that. Um, and then, uh, you know, social security kind of uh, the basis of our, of our in social insurance state, which has proven like the most enduringly a popular government policy, and there's lots of good economic reasons for it too, blah, blah, blah. The, um, the ineffective parts of the New Deal or counterproductive were the, um, uh, the well, well the, um, the National Recovery Act had all these provisions for essentially fixing prices, uh, essentially allowing businesses, encouraging and allowing businesses to cartelize. That was a bad idea. <laughs> Um, that was sort of restricted abundance in the, in the end didn't help anybody because these guys, you know, they weren't thinking economically. They were just thinking, oh, well, businesses don't have enough money to hire people, so let's allow them to charge higher prices. Well, okay, but then people have to pay higher prices so they don't buy as much stuff. And anyway, uh, they just weren't thinking that through very carefully. Uh, the very similar approach was the Agricultural Adjustment Act, the famous, like, you know, go shoot all the cows bill. Um, I think they, they actually did go from primarily try to create artificial scarcity, burn some crops, things like that, uh, because the idea was, okay, these sellers, because, so interestingly, I don't want to go off on this giant tangent about the New Deal, but one of the interesting things about why they did this was because data collection was really bad. So um, what these 
reason these guys were trying to help producers is because at that point, surveys, survey data was sent for individuals was essentially non-existent. All you knew, the only way you quantitatively knew that the economy was suffering is because you could go around and ask these businesses, how many people are you hiring? How much property are you making? And so because you could only get data from businesses because of the inherent limitations of data collection, you know, their, their first idea was, okay, well, these businesses need more money. Let's get them. And so they, uh, you know, let's get them some more money by allowing them to cartelize by creating artificial scarcity. And it didn't work. Essentially, um, this part is sort of the middle third of the New Deal. And after that, they backtracked. So they, at, at first, they did a bunch of financial rescue stuff that worked. Then they did a bunch of this crap, didn't work. Then they backtracked on that and did a bunch of social insurance stuff, which worked, but didn't, you know, necessarily address the unemployment problem. And then they did World War II, which fixed everything. Um, and so then that was basically the story. Of the new I mean, it's it's kind of an interesting place to start, though, right? Because like it it seems like the high water mark of build a lot of stuff liberalism in America. And uh, if you were going to tell a story about why that fell apart, you could. Um, this is Mingus the cat who says hello. But um, <laughs> uh, but if you're going to tell a story, a lot of it could be about backlash to those kinds of large projects, like the TVA flooded multiple towns uh, and caused enormous backlash about that. Um, like for years, not just during the um, uh, the uh, New Deal era, um, you had Robert Moses and sort of broad urban renewal policies where there was like no community input at all and uh, no environmental impact scores. And so we we went from a, a period where there were generally no like goo goo things to to um, check and make sure the things we're building isn't too disruptive to one where those are completely paralyzing. Um, and so I'm I'm curious how how each of you maybe we can start with Kim think about that and then um, uh, I think Kevin has a question after that. So I, I do see you, Kevin. Um, can you can you what's a succinct version of the question? I just want to succinct version of the question is um, how did we get how did we build up this this sort of regulatory system that that has become such uh, that that has has put has such a stranglehold on our ability to grow and build things like both housing but also other things and is that a story of like backlash or is that just sort of good ideas gone too far but how do you think about that um i mean i think specifically when it comes to housing i think i mean i think it's I mean, I could tell like the 50 year story, but I also think the regulations themselves are symptomatic of like, I mean, I think in, in any type of like Anglo-based property system, I mean, like the, the Anglo system is based around like property ownership. And so inherent in, you know, property ownership is this sort of expectation that property value, property is an asset and property values have to rise. And so um, I sort of think all the zoning regulations are kind of downstream of that, like they would emerge in some form or format because of that original choice, um, which is like, you know, distinct culturally from other systems where like Germany, where it's a majority tenant society or, you know, Japan, which I mean, Noah can correct me if I'm wrong or not, because you're the Japan expert, but like, you know, there's, there's lots of stories about how, in, you know, in Japan, housing is considered more disposable. Um, versus versus in you know the UK or United States where we're just our system is just more prone to like fancy rehabs of existing really really old housing stock um but to tell the shorter term story I mean at least in California like you know I think the 19th century had a lot of the same same questions and issues that we had which give the rise to you know figures like Henry George but then, you know, the invention of the car as a tech piece of technology um, kind of, you know, at least temporarily delayed the issue. And so that, you know, the car and the associated freeway system and subsidization of the suburbs, you know, sort of gave us like another 50 year reprieve from this question because we just built lots of suburbs with cheap land. And then, you know, whatever people people could get the asset value that over time got priced into that land. But eventually we had to return to the same question again, which is like, you know, if if property values and housing values are kind of outpacing wages, you just have this system that structurally, like fewer, a smaller and smaller percentage of people every year are going to be able to afford. Um, and you know, once we kind of got that 
you know, 30, 40 year bump, you know, for the generation after World War II, um, you know, a lot of the cheap buildable land in California, the flatlands, um, got kind of got built out with the initial Greenfield suburbs. And then you started have quite having questions again of like, how are we going to add more people here? And, you know, the seventies are when we started adding a lot of restrictions around, you know, what you could build, um, you know, there's a lot of down zoning. And then eventually, obviously, um, as the scarcity of housing, you know, started getting priced in, in this, in, in the 70s into the California housing stock, we eventually had the taxpayer revolt with Prop 13, which then ensconced another layer of protections for property owners into our economic system. And so we've been kind of writing on this like capped property tax system. I, I don't know if that, how many people are here are familiar with it, but like in California, when you buy a house, like your property tax assessment kind of just stays the same plus, you know, 2% per year. And so you have these great discrepancies between neighboring houses where somebody's paying a property tax rate from like 50 years ago. I mean, 40 years ago next to someone who's paying a modern property tax rate. So yeah, I mean, over time, all these things got added decade after decade. And, you know, that coincided with the emergence of more visible homelessness in California. And it's just sort of the affordability problem has been kind of riding up the whole income ladder ever since then. And it's just, it, it gets worse and worse every year. Um, and yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't know how, I don't know if I have much more to add than that, but yeah, we created a vetocracy basically. It's really hard to get stuff done. No, that's great. Um, Kevin, you had your hand up. Uh, uh, let's get at it. Sure. So, so the discussion of the, the new deal made me think of recent events. So rightly or wrongly, the current bout of inflation is associated strongly with the recovery efforts from governments during the pandemic. And so I'm wondering, um, at least in the short to medium term, uh, especially if inflation now persists for a while longer, wreaks more havoc, um, does that make it harder for governments around the world to actually lead these kinds of abundance efforts? I don't, I don't know if Noah had some thoughts on that. Can you repeat that question? So uh, governments really stepped in with stimulus support, et cetera, during the pandemic. And now we have this uh, period of inflation, which uh, many people associate as a, uh, as, see as right. a result of that stimulus. So if, if, if you now have an abundance agenda and say like government should do more of this, does that make it politically much harder? Oh, um, maybe. I mean, you know, inflation is basically, uh, in some very general sense, too much money chasing after too few goods. And, um, you know, so on one sense, it's like, okay, maybe it makes it harder because you can't uh, just splurge a bunch of money on stuff because that's going to pump up demand and, you know, make everything scarcer. The, on the other hand, you can give this argument of like, oh, we have inflation, we actually need to uh, build more stuff. Um, yeah, so I think it could go either way. I mean, the Biden administration has certainly been trying to make this argument. They've been trying to say, look, um, uh, you know, inflation is high, we need more capacity, and so we need to spend more to build up that capacity. Thing is, people are like, no, let's not spend more because then maybe you go through this intermediate stage. Um, and of course, you could always shift spending from things like social welfare, healthcare to building stuff. And then people get really mad um, because not only you have inflation, but suddenly, you know, the government isn't paying for as much of your health care. And that's so. Um, so I do think that, you know, a, a period of inflation makes things more difficult politically. Um, but, you know, uh, not to not to. Um, yeah, that's right. So, so maybe the the sort of deflation that we had in the uh, in the depression, or the sort of disinflation we had during the Great Recession, made it more easy to build stuff, and maybe we missed our moment in that sense. But I think that um, there's a couple of things you can do. First of all, this times of inflation are a great time to do the deregulation piece of it because you can all you know, and we Jimmy Carter did that in the '70s. You know, Jimmy Carter, not Ronald Reagan, was the great deregulator, and he deregulated energy and transportation not Reagan. Um, and so I think that, you know, now would be a great time to kill all the housing regulation and let people build more housing. 
Minneapolis did it, and there, suddenly people are building twice as much housing in Minneapolis as they were before. And so, um, so that so because, like I said, because there's different methods you can use for this, you don't necessarily need to have the government step in and build everything. This, you know, inflation is a great opportunity to do some deregulation because people don't like deregulation because it hurts incumbent interests. It's obviously true for housing. It's true for everything. It's true for companies. It's, true, it's really true everywhere. So inflation can be your excuse to get that done. Never let a good crisis go to waste. How's that for an answer? Uh, appropriately bleak. Um, uh. <laughs> but it's not bleak, is it? Because like, you know, if, if you start out thinking of methods, thinking like what we need is big, you know, government building more things, we want to do this via the government, you're thinking of methods first. But if you're thinking of goals first, you just sort of act opportunistically to, to sort of take advantage of whatever opportunities you have. It's sort of like in a war, right? It's like, are we going to hit them from the air or are we going to hit them from the ground or blah, blah, blah. And then you just, whatever they do, you do what's necessary to, to beat that. You know, and so it's like, whatever the economy does, we do what's necessary to, uh, to build more things in that environment, right? So it's the fact that we are dealing with a different situation than the New Deal and therefore have to use different tools in the New Deal should not make us sad if our goal is simply to use whatever tools necessary to get the stuff. You know, so my, my motto is get the stuff and the git has G-I-T, it's um, Texan. Get the stuff is my motto. <laughs> it's not bleak, it's just, it's just adjust yeah. tactics, you know, go where yeah. the enemy goes. Kevin is explaining that, uh, that imputed rent is taxed in, in Switzerland, which indeed it is the, the, one, the one country that economists truly love on this. <laughs> yeah, while you guys are talking, the Europeans are chatting about our own horror <laughs> stories from our respective locations and the, yeah, the kind of crazy and completely contradictory laws um, present. I, I would love to get some more international perspective, either from, from panelists or, or guests here, that a lot of this feels particularly American, that, that uh, in a lot of America, you have a, a municipal government you might have a sub-municipal government. In DC, we have something called advisory neighborhood councils that are elected officers at a neighborhood level. Uh, and then there's a county government above that uh, often. Uh, then there's the state government, then there's a the federal government. They all have different rules uh, and different avenues and like a, a system of a very adversarial legalism where, where suing is really, really common to try to block stuff. And like, the basic political economy of incumbents don't want new stuff to get built seems similar, but I'm, I'm curious if some of the Europeans here have, have some experiences or, or anecdotes about sort of what that comparison looks like. I know a little bit about Brussels, but actually my friend Orsh is here who is an economist and maybe you know more because <laughs> I, I kind of know hearsay based people complaining and rolling their eyes, but you're, you're, you're more of an expert if you want to jump in. Yes, so Tex, I was actually um, uh, thinking a lot about what you were saying. I'm um, an economist. I've been working for the European Commission for over 10 years, and my specific domain is pharmaceuticals. And right now we are really thinking about how to revise the legislation to make sure that we have a, a bigger abundance of, um, of innovative medicines at an affordable price. And I think it's really true what you were saying about the um, the supply side being very uh, domain specific. Um, and uh, it's much, yeah, I mean, pharmaceuticals are difficult because you, you can't really work on the, the, the demand side. The demand is there, people get sick, they need pharmaceuticals. But uh, we are thinking a lot about how we can support the big pharma to do more innovations. And I think that's just one way to think about it. If we really want to have more medicines, as you said it, we should really look at the more diverse um, um, interventions, public-private innovations. So this is a bit going off from the housing crisis, but you know, when you have your mind something on something, it's difficult to <laughs> uh, it's difficult to go off topic. I 
it's kind of one one take on on the pandemic as well. I would imagine. Uh, what I know about the the Brussels uh, housing situation is that um, for if you want to, be, it's a really interesting combination. I think that's very typical of Western Europe. But or she correct me if I'm wrong, which is that you have rent control. And so as a landlord, there are very, very strict laws in place to determine how much you can raise. Um, um, and, and, you know, people who rent, who rent do play with that a little bit. Uh, but there's also a lot of, um, a lot, there are a lot of rules around how, you know, for instance, you can't build an office building um, downtown in Brussels without making, I think, 60% of the building um, residential. Um, and just since I've been kind of coming and going, and then now I'm partly based in Brussels, um, I've seen, you know, entire central areas blossom. And now there is, you know, now there is a hipster cafe, and there is a jazz bar, and there is a gym, and people go out. And, and you know, for us, it's actually like a, something that, that you follow visually from year to year, how uh, if, even during the pandemic, you could even tell during the pandemic that you know, uh, I've only lived in new built houses and in, in Brussels, for instance. So if you want to say, like, I actually care about like windows closing, then there is an option to, you know, move into a building that was completed last year. And maybe just to add on that, in, in Belgium, you have a lot of social housing, not, not necessarily in the center, but maybe a bit outside still uh, in, in areas that are easy to commute. And the rent would be something like uh, two to five hundred dollars per month for a decent apartment of, of two, two, two bedrooms. So you have quite a lot of state intervention on that one. Uh, yeah, Kevin. Uh, might want to unmute. Yep, sorry. And I had two brief anecdotes about uh, how this goes down in Zurich because we vote on everything here, right? It's not just the government that decides. A couple of times a year, we, we get these uh, booklets we have to read and then vote on like every minutia of local construction, even like the local schoolhouse. So there are two, two things I wanna highlight that show you how maybe it's not just the government that's a limit, but if you handle, if you have direct democracy, actually people uh, can block uh, an abundance agenda. So one, was um, there's a road that goes uh, straight through Zurich. It's quite loud, it's quite noisy, it's always congested. And the city said like, let's build a tunnel. Like let's get this underground and uh, turn this whole part of the city essentially into a pedestrian area. Ah, but it takes seven years of construction. So everyone voted no. Um, the second one was that people in Zurich absolutely hate, hate high rise buildings and almost reflexively will vote against them. So when the city was saying like, we're knocking down this football stadium. So we have all this area in the city center and we're gonna build like a high rise housing, social housing, low income housing, um, uh, people organized against it. And I remember what they led the campaign with and it still makes me laugh is that the building would be so tall that the primary school next to it would then be in the shade and that would be bad for the children. Did they see the mountains that give shade in Zurich? No. It's just pe people don't don't want to have uh, change. They don't want to have tall buildings next to them. You're right. We can almost, uh, to some degree, we can look at, uh, you know, nimbyism across different places to isolate the factors. We can sort of do a regression. In fact, you could do this formally. Um, it would be difficult to isolate causality, but you could do it formally. Um, so for example, uh, you know, one, one very common and I think pretty true uh, idea about American NIMBYism is that a lot of it is based on some combination of racism and classism. It's, you know, like a lot of the fragmentation of cities, uh, the zoning regulations, you know, the single family uh, mandates and uh, highway, the way highways were constructed, et cetera, was essentially either keep the black people away or keep the poor people away and definitely keep the poor black people away. And of course, in California, where we have built a multiracial utopia, we have now uh, put that all behind us. So now we have, um, you know, extremely kaleidoscopic internecine weird racial uh, micro conflicts uh, that for the genetic But Europe probably has some of the same shit. 
And uh, it would be interesting to look at the different places to see the kinds of nimbyisms that get made. And, you know, whether it affects demand for public transportation, whether it affects, you know, multifamily housing, subsidized housing, things like that. There, some component of nimbyism is simply don't, you know, I don't want many people on my street. I want this street to be, pay, I want someone to pay to maintain this lovely, leafy, quiet street, but then I don't want anyone else on it. Well, okay, who do you think is going to pay? Well, people somewhere else, because we don't have enough people here to pay for like this manicured sidewalk with tr manicured trees and everything looks exactly perfect and really nice. That takes labor, you know, and you need money. And in order to have the money, you need the tax base, you need the people there. So it's incredibly expensive to maintain this sort of manicured uh, suburbia, but people everywhere seem to sort of want it. Um, people, you know, people want the sun. That's I mean, that's a pretty reasonable one. There's even a, um, in, J in Japanese, there's actually a word for this. There's a word for the right to sunlight, which is Hatsugenken, which is, uh, it just means the right to sunlight. And it's like, it just means in urban settings, you know, you have the right to have the sun shine on your house for a certain number of hours a day. And so, <laughs> Um, yeah, that's, that's actually reasonable. And then there's, you know, there's also property value in NIMBYism, like, you know, if we have all these congestion externalities, or if we have like poor people moving into the neighborhood and subsidized housing, our property values will go down. There's, um, yeah, and then there's just like, there's simple like segregationism, uh, if you want to call it that. And, uh, and so there's all these reasons for NIMBYism, and I think it's instructive to sort of look at different reasons. Um, but, but that, sort of honestly facing those reasons is key to addressing it, right? Because if people really, really want quiet, leafy streets and we want density, we're gonna have to figure out some method of construction that gives people streets that seem quiet and leafy while also actually being dense, if people really, really demand that. And there are places like that. You know, you can actually, you can just take a bunch of trees and put them in front of a fourplex, the same as you can put them in front of a single family home, except now four people live in that home. Right, and so there's there's ways to get, uh, you know, density to some degree. You know, you're not going to get uh, you're not going to get Manhattan. You're not going to get Tokyo, but you're going to get it. Um, oh, fun fact: Tokyo is less dense than Manhattan. Um, Tokyo is not actually as dense as people think because we measure density by who sleeps in a place, not by who stands in a place. So the reason Tokyo is less dense is because Tokyo has these. Imagine New Jersey, and now imagine five of that. And imagine arranging them all around Tokyo. And now imagine people who are willing to endure hour and a half commutes each way every day on the train because the trains are so nice and well kept and efficient and, and you know, you, but quiet. And you can just like read your book or do your work or whatever on the train an hour and a half each way. And so people are living out and wherever. So the inside of Tokyo is actually less dense, even though it's always choked with people working. Um, so anyway, th that just shows how transit is, is really important. And how, how anti-train nimbyism really is in many ways as bad as anti-housing nimbyism. And really there's a synergy between those. Um, you have countries where they're actually pretty good at building lots of housing, but not good at building transit for it, like Thailand um, or Indonesia. And um, in fact, you even see some, some nimbies in the Bay Area saying, well, we don't want to become like Thailand or Indonesia. Let's not build all this housing. We'll just build trains too. It's like you're blocking the train. You're like, well, we don't want to become like, Jakarta, which has all these houses, but no trains, so we're not going to build houses either. No, build the trains. And so you, you, there's this synergy between public transit and housing. That, and that's why I talk so much about goals, because um, when we talk about method, when we talk about who's going to build the housing, who's going to build the trains, you know, and when we spend all day arguing about this, then we ignore the fact that we need both of those things. We, we, we de-emphasize the vision of a place with dense housing and effective public transit and how to, you know, how to build that, where to start. You know, I, I mean, like, obviously in California, Scott Wiener's got a pretty good plan of, of taking existing transit hubs, allow a lot of housing around them and then sort of fill in that way. That's really great. I love that because that is a, um, that's more about the goals. It's about the type of city we want to build. We want to have these transit hubs with dense housing right around them. That's great. That's like a vision for what this, these cities will look like. And then you can get buy-in for that vision. And I think we just de-emphasize that vision and we fight over methods before we even know what our goals are. And if you do that, pretty soon you've got a Jakarta kind of situation or something, 
or just gridlock. Anyway, that's my that's my thought about that. So we've been talking mostly about about cities and and yibbyism and nimbyism and and uh, sort of growth as re regards to housing. I wanted to to talk a bit about uh, growth as regards to innovation and sort of last mile problems from from innovations to um, uh, to actual built environments. And and this is where I wanted to to get some of of Kim May's thoughts um, that. I we sometimes joke in my job at Vox that that about doing a um, uh, a column about things that there was a TED talk for ten years ago saying that there's this new invention that's going to change the world and then the world remains unaltered in that respect <laughs> and sort of uh, trying to go through what happened and I think when you talk to people in the progress studies community they're very excited about things like that like you talk to someone like Eli Dorado about. Uh, getting really good drills that can drill all the way uh, into the Earth's crust and and make it viable to do geothermal anywhere in the world. Um, you talk to, I mean, I feel like I've been having my leg pulled by self-driving cars for a long time, um, uh, though I, I still have some hope. Um, Kim, I was curious if you could talk a bit about what what some of the sort of what you've learned about like that last gap and and how how you think about uh technologies where we get something new from like a lab or or r d this seems like something that should be very profitable that we can build out um but it it stalls what, what are the reasons for stalling and and is it um, is it this story I mean, of yeah if it's a really hardware i mean if it's a really hardware oriented thing i mean hardware i mean like if you take if you take even just pure like software versus hardware like like I was saying kind of implying earlier if you're doing software like are you looking at 80 percent gross margin like much cheaper to acquire customers you can launch from day one you can navigate and find product market fit versus like hardware you've got to build lots of prototypes you have to figure out a supply chain um the supply chain is kind of fucked right now like and then you don't know if customers would want it because you don't even have the you can't even sell the thing because you don't have the volume of thing to sell so like it, yeah, I mean, it's much, it's, it's just, it's just harder. I mean, it just, it's harder from everyone. And because it's harder, capital is just not going to be as attracted towards it because of those reasons. And so, for example, and I mean, in, in the instance of like a drill, um, you know, what an investor would need to feel to take that risk is some pathway towards seeing where, you know, and when buyers show up. And so in that sense, if you were to try and like practice supply, cited progressivism and, you know, from an implementation perspective, I can't, you know, I'm not in a position in DC to say like what, we, what you would need to make like the buying process of it, but like the government as a buyer would be a key important thing. Like if we are looking at geothermal, if we're looking at carbon removal, you know, private site, private sector companies can do some stuff to creatively stimulate the industry, like, like Stripe, Shopify and Microsoft are doing on um, carbon removal, but like, they're just not big enough to take a company to the kind of scale we need to, yeah. they're not a big enough buyer to take a company to the scale that we need to, to like, to have a meaningful industry. And so like the government has to be a buyer there. And then there has to be enough, like at least incremental, like gated sales, even in the beginning, like if it's like 500 K here or a million or 10 million, um, even if it's like a very nominal amount, but like that would be meaningful that would be a meaningful initial revenue just to like, you know, attract the initial private sector side investments to make, to make companies on that, that side happen. Like, yeah, that, that, that's what I'd say. Yeah. Something I was, I think about a lot is uh, during one of the debates in 2012, there was a huge shouting match between Obama and Romney over Obama giving loans to Tesla. And Romney was like, this is this like far left, like, Enviro company that you were just like burning taxpayer money on, like, like what are you doing? And it's obviously the political valence of supporting Tesla has. I has mean, flipped. But, yeah, I know. But I mean, like somebody, whenever he was like running that. Bain Capital, he should just they just open your book. Like, how many things did you take a bet on that like went to zero? Probably a lot, but there were it was kind of it was canceled out by all the other things that you made money on. And so, like, yeah, there's a lot of tolerance for that in the price, like it particularly in venture, like there is some percentage of, I mean, whatever you write, like ultimately as an adventure investor, like the write-offs or the write-downs to zero don't, don't really 
I mean, I, I mean, they do matter, but they don't really matter because ultimately how good you are is really, did you take a bet on the thing that like, you know, that was the next, um, you know, Google or whatever, right. like you can write everything else down. It doesn't matter. Usually there's just one company, you know, there's one or two companies because of the power law that returns the entire, the entire portfolio returns, research returns the fund. Um, but like, there's just not that kind of voter sophistication and certainly not immediate, like just the media is just not equipped to cover it or to understand it from a portfolio basis. That makes sense. Um, yeah. So, so Kim, I, I wanted to, to briefly ask you about a thing, which is, you know, I hear people, you know, talk about, uh, especially, you know, Catherine Boyle, who I'm currently interviewing for my blog. Uh, we're about to wrap that up. Cool. But, um, you know, people talk about using investment capital to accomplish this or that sort of general social purpose. And, and I'm always a little wary of this, like, you know, in economics, we think that companies, including investors, the companies can only really accomplish social purposes when they have a lot of monopoly power. And, you know, to the degree that, you know, if you're, if you're Google and you just print money because you have this search monopoly, then maybe you can engage in a whole bunch of like unprofitable side projects to like make the world better. Maybe you have the, you know, uh, ability. Um, but then once once times get tough and competition increases, you lose that ability because you have to respect the bottom line or die. And um, and so you know, it's the Wolf of Wall Street argument. But it's the Gary Becker argument in, in economics. And so so I'm wondering, like, why do investors think? Why do some investors think that they'll actually be able to do? And, and of course, this this applies not just to you know like abundance agenda kind of thing, but also to Things like um, uh, ESG, I guess, or just a lot of you know a lot of socially responsible investing and things like this. Why do why do investors think they have the extra money to do that kind of stuff instead of just focusing on like whatever the market demands they do in order to make money? Like, wh where is that surplus coming? Um, from? I don't know. I mean, when people say stuff like that, I mean, honestly, I mean, I think it's just it's. I'm not. I'm not. I, I want to say I'm not dismissing that there isn't truth in it, but like it is at the end of the day, that's just this marketing, right? You're marketing your your mission as a capital provider in order to find like other, you know, mission oriented entrepreneurs. Um, so, uh, but at the end of the day, like if you run a fund or a firm, you are judged at the end of your tenure by the returns on that fund. Um, that said, like, if there are things there, like there are clearly things out there that consumers really want and, and need, right? So, and, and those can align with things that we think are good for society. Um, so I'm not, I don't actually, I mean, I don't, I'm not, not not sure if I'm like refuting or agreeing with you. Like I, 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 do, I mean, I refute the part that you have to be a monopoly to provide any social, like, like I social good. I, but I also think that like, when anybody ever talks about that kind of stuff, it's marketing. That makes sense. Yeah. But it also means that that also tells us a lot about where we're going to get real action from. We are going I, I'm, to get- I'm, I'm like always, I've always been a believer in like, you know, intelligent public private synchronization of regulatory policy and then private entrepreneurship. Like, I think right. there are ways of getting, but like, every single question and problem is pretty, I think is pretty sophisticated and it takes a sophisticated um, set of actors to make a solution that works for it. Right, right. And I think that, that do, do you think that um, the pandemic has forced people to um, sort of rediscover, re-embrace the idea of public-private partnerships in a way that they did not uh, before? Um. I don't know. Um, I, I, I don't, I mean, this is a question I actually wanted to ask Dylan today. I don't know if, are you still living in DC? Are you in DC or are you somewhere else? I am, I am DC, in DC. Okay. I'm in my, yeah, my I'm, apartment. Yeah. I actually wanted to ask you the question, like if the lesson from the Obama administration was we didn't do enough. And then this time we kind of like did that, like, what's the lesson that's going to come away from how we reacted to this recession? Um, yeah. that is going to prevail in the Democratic Party? I mean, I think a lot of it depends on how Powell sticks to landing. That's kind of a boring answer. But okay. um, but so there's a there's a story of the next few months, I can imagine, where core inflation cools down, 
uh, some of the pressures around oil and gas from, from Ukraine and Russia cool. Um, inflation gets back to, if not normal, then three to 4%, not end of the world levels um, at some point in 2023. I know it is boring. Um, but <laughs> uh, And I think if that happens, and things are sort of on the rise, it, it will be a little like what happened to Reagan in that uh, Volcker engineered incredibly brutal recessions in 81, 82, um, but it was on the upswing in time for Reagan to run for re-election. And so he was remembered as a successful president who managed the economy well. Um, if it doesn't go like that and the timing is worse, maybe he gets remembered like Carter, uh, who's, who faced the presidential election right. in the wrong time in that cycle. Um, Kills demand now so it can recover by the time 2024 <laughs> rolls around. Yeah, and I, I think sort of part of why I got sort of convinced to support rate hikes, despite never having supported a rate hike in my entire life until this year, um, was, I think uh, Karen uh, Karen Dynan, who's a, a really good economist at Harvard, he used to be at the Fed, was like, I don't think we need to do a full Volcker shock right now, but if we wait a year, we might have to. Um, and I think that made a lot of sense to me, both as sort of economic analysis and as political analysis of like, that is that is much worse. Donald Trump has a much big, better chance of being president again, if that's what happens. Um, and- We're, we're uh, running out of time for the Volcker thing here. Yeah. To, to be honest, like if a Volcker recession lasts two years and we Volcker the economy right now, it will be a recession just in time for, you know, people's, people, the election. We will not have time for like the, the two year recovery needed to convince people that like everything's fine. Had we done it at the very beginning of the administration, in, in political terms, in terms of the timing of the macroeconomics, the Biden's COVID bill was a mistake. In humanitarian terms, <laughs> you know, I think it was a good thing and I supported it and I was very enthused about it. In political terms, it might've been a mistake. So I think our best, our best bet now in political terms in order to prevent a Trump re-election is to just have, have demand, like is, is to have demand be uh, hurt, but not that hurt. So it doesn't take as long to recover. And I think we're seeing that. Actually. I think right now we're seeing consumption fall. We're seeing investment fall. We're seeing wealth effects dry up. We've had effective austerity. Um, deficits are just way, way below even where they were in this month in 2019. You know, deficits are just way down. Um, and then, you know, the Fed is hiking and that's, you know, if, if the Fed does a couple more of those, it'll it won't be enough to volcker the economy, but it'll be enough to sort of restrain people's belief that, oh, the Fed doesn't care about inflation now. And so, so I think we have the chance to engineer a soft landing, which will give us time for recovery by 2024, but it's gonna be pretty tight. And I hope these people are actually thinking about that instead of just sort of, I mean, I don't know, like this, this administration has been a little hapless with some things. Yeah, I mean, I think the, there are, uh, I've been making a lot of contrasts between the first Obama term and the first Biden term. And they seem like in the early months, I was I was grading Biden very well because I was also very excited about the rescue plan. I think it's pretty clear in retrospect that it was several hundred billion too big. Um, and uh, that's hard to know ahead of time. And I think my line then was, it's better to err on the side of too much than too little. And I still think that's true. I'm less confident that that's true just because the the degree of backlash to inflation has been incredibly severe and and the political costs might be much higher than I anticipated. But another thing just to, to loop it into kind of the theme of, of um, the salon is uh, the 2009 stimulus, part of why it wasn't a very good stimulus is that it had a lot of like infrastructure and sort of like physical building projects like uh i think they finally got rid of them but for a long time all the buses in dc said like paid for by the american recovery and reinvestment act of 2009 um, there was a lot of like money for for transit programs for for highway reconstruction for uh and when questioned on whether this was a good stimulus they would say no the programs are shovel ready and they weren't like the shovels had to wait a little bit um, but they were doing real physical things Part of what was so interesting to me about the rescue plan is that it was like, it was all just like moving money around. There was no physical aspect to it at all. There was, you sent people checks, uh, 
sort of regardless. You send unemployed people bonus checks. Uh, you send just cash money to state governments to spend how they see fit. Um, it, it's almost exclusively transfers as opposed to um, sort of building new physical things. And I think that was remarkably effective as stimulus, probably too effective. Um, but it, it did reflect a kind of, we've given up on the idea that we're gonna like build something with this. And, and some of it also might've been like, they have this infrastructure bill they think they can pass on a bipartisan basis. So I, I wanna be fair to them on that. But it was a really serious contrast between those two efforts. Anyway. Um, yeah, I, I think that much of the DC class really learned the lessons of 2008 very, very, and 2009 and 2010 extremely well, perhaps a little too well. Because imagine if, if Biden hadn't gone big because of fear of inflation, when inflation still hadn't really ramped up much and it was still at like 2.5% or whatever, and people were like, inflation? What the fuck? Something happened in the 70s? Like, everyone would have been so mad at Biden. And then, then um, you know, inflation would have risen somewhat anyway, like it did in Europe. And then it would have been, well, it would have made it worse, guys. But the point is that, like, until you actually see us causing some inflation, you don't know that that's a thing that can happen. Economists believe theories and believe historical analogies and read books, and they're like, oh, yeah. But they don't, um, but, but politicians can't, you know. Um, but it would have been the one thing I would have looked at if I had been in the Biden administration in early 2021 is the opinion polls about the most important economic problem facing America that Gallup has done since forever. And what's interesting is that in the 70s, the, in, the number of people saying inflation is our worst economic problem went higher than the number of people saying unemployment was our greatest problem in the Great Recession, considerably higher, and much higher than the number of people who said unemployment was our biggest problem in the Volcker Recession. In other words, that tells you that, and, and there's a very, very obvious reason for this which is in terms of if you have a logarithmic utility function, you know, where we, we're, we're all good Rawlsians and, you know, we care about the, uh, we care more about the, um, the suffering of the worst off in society and the worst off in society, the people who are unemployed, the few people who get hit by recession, you know, unemployment goes to 10%. Okay, well, that's 10% of people who are hurt. And the reason everyone else is mad, if they're mad, it's because their wages are being restrained by a greater pool of unemployed workers and greater labor supply, excess labor supply. That is why everyone else is upset, right? And they're afraid of unemployment. People don't like unemployment, but most people aren't hit by it. Even in the Great Depression, we had 25% unemployment, just apocalyptic. That means 75% of people were working in the Great Depression. And so obviously unemployment spills over into lower wages and fear, but it really is a thing where the, where the harms are concentrated. Inflation, the harms are not concentrated. The harms are, although, you know, actually they're, they're not nearly as concentrated. There's a few people who like escape inflation. Uh, and in fact, in this current inflation, at least in 2021, when the inflation was more demand-based, you did see workers at the bottom of the distribution actually seeing wage gains that outpaced inflation. That's great. You're like, yay, I'm a Rawlsian. The people who are at the bottom of the pile are being helped. We help the poor, yay. And everyone else is like, no, I was hurt. Fuck you. You know, I'm going to vote Republican. It's like, we have a one person, one vote, not one util, one vote system, right? <laughs> if, you know, 90% of people lose one util and, you know, like 10% uh, of people each, like, you know, gain like a million utils, you lose at the polls because the 10% of people who gained can only vote once. Each. And so, you know, it's like, um, that's, that's a crude way of putting it. Obviously it's more complicated than that, but I think that um, that's why inflation is, makes people angry is because it hits people more uniformly. And that was a thing that should have been remembered that wasn't. But again, maybe there's nothing we could have done. We just had to like step in the shit to know that there's shit there. Pardon my vulgarity. Yeah, I've, I've never heard that word shit before, but um, I'll look it up after this. Um, About half of every word I say. These <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny that you say that because in some ways, like the, the classic um, 
the classic political economy story is always that um, stuff with diff with concentrated uh, costs and diffuse benefits never works out, and stuff with um, diffuse uh, costs and concentrated benefits should be good. That this is if you read like Banker Olson, he'll talk about how like you can build these distributive coalitions uh, where like you do something like uh, like a tariff is a great example. Like you, uh, you put a tariff on uh, foreign trucks, um, and uh, that mildly hurts everyone in America, but makes the small number of American uh, producing truck companies better off. And inflation seems like a situation where there there are diffuse costs, but they're nonetheless salient enough to become a really really big problem. And, and I don't know if that's just like. Uh, it's diffuse compared to what, uh, and that that if the diffuse effects are big enough, you can still have big outcomes. But it's it's not my normal model of how something comes to dominate politics. Um, anyway, David. Um, hi. Yeah, I'd I'd love to hear a little bit more. Um, Noah, you mentioned um, how the goals are really what we should be focusing on, or what you know the, the outcomes are what we should be focusing on. Um, and I'm kind of curious, like, I, I, I agree completely with that. I think, um, I don't know if everybody's familiar with evidence-based government, government um, you know, sort of defining outcomes ahead of time, um, determining whether the thing you're doing, the regulation, the stimulus, whatever it is, whether it's actually accomplishing the goal, like having it be a measurable outcome, kind of like in science, how you set up an endpoint for a study um, ahead of time, and that's the thing everybody's agreeing on, you know, like when the voters, we can take take this to the voters, the voters can say, ah, I see, like, this is the thing we're trying to accomplish. And focusing, as you say, less on the, the methods and more on, you know, what, what actually the result is, and then maybe automatically rolling back if it doesn't match or like that there's some, you know, semi rollback, but only matches partly or whatever the, the you know, predetermined thing is. Um, so, so that's sort of question one, like, how can we really get more focus on the goals and what are the ways that we can sort of accomplish that. And the other is, I've, I've sort of, it's come up a few times so far that, um, uh, you know, there, a, a kind of disconnect between how voters and, you know, politics in general works, like what, what sort of sells, what's what gets focused on, whether there's sophistication in the voters um, to think about things like, you know, uh, like the Tesla uh, example that was given earlier. Um, I, my view is that that's a major weakness sort of in democracy and like what what are do you guys have ideas uh, or thoughts on like what can be done about bringing the voters on board for the stuff that we're all talking about well, what's the weakness in democracy say again uh, in just sort of like uh, the the um, the example that was that may give gave earlier about uh, um, uh, you know the it was brought up in the debate. I actually forget who brought it, but but in the debate between Obama and Mitt Romney, that it was sort of used as a as a sort of a thing to to bring down Obama that he had he had uh, been responsible for for subsidizing Tesla, and that the voters were not really capable of understanding this idea of like a portfolio. Like even if it had zeroed out, like it hadn't returned on the investment, the idea that you're kind of making bets, uh, like in venture capital, you're you're betting on a, a large number of companies, and you only need like one or two to pay off. Um, but in politics, you can sort of use all the failures. You can use the 99 failures as sort of like political tools and debates and say like, he, he gave a billion dollars here and that company failed. He gave a billion dollars there and that company failed. Um, does that sort of make sense? No, what I'm, is that an example? Like the, how voters are, are sort of unable to think in the way, for example, that a venture capitalist or, is, or is yes, that economy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but so, so one of the problems here is that people are just really bad at selling these kind of things. So for example, the same program that supported Solyndra supported Tesla. The Republicans were great about saying, look, Solyndra failed, blah, blah, blah. The Democrats were shit about saying, look, Tesla, ha ha, we win. And part of that is simply because of the fundamental problem of American politics, which I hope Dylan will back me up on. Maybe he thinks the fundamental problem of American politics is something else like you know, the Senate or something. But I think the fundamental problem of American politics that, uh, I mean, this, people used to not complain about the Senate. We started complaining once it stopped work, you know, once once the the dist urban distribution of votes became such that it became less representative. Also, once it started hurting Democrats, because there was a time when the Senate actually helped Democrats against Republicans and Democrats didn't complain a lot. But anyway, 
back to what I'm saying. The fundamental problem in American politics is that we have one group of a, a very cohesive group of assholes who knows exactly what they want, uh, arrayed against a diverse, highly diverse group of people with highly divergent interests who each know only a little piece of what they want, and the only thing they really know what they want is for the, the is for their the cohesive group of assholes to not have power, and that we call those the we call that the Democrats. We have a a gaggle of outgroups versus a, a single cohesive in-group. And, and so the Democrats can't trumpet the success of Tesla because what about all the Democrats who get mad at the idea that the government's subsidizing a bunch of companies? When, oh, you made Elon Musk rich. Oh no, look at this rich asshole. I mean, like Elon Musk was a total Democrat. Now he's trying to like be a Republican so that he can get like, I don't know, Texas to approve direct sales of Tesla cars. Or basically just that, like, you know, he, he feels which way the wind is blowing. But, um, but I don't know. Uh, also, lefties yelled at him online. No one likes that, right? Um, man, lefties, lefties really yelled at me a lot online this week when I made fun of the, um, the hats from that protest back in 2017, the pink hats. I made fun of them. Oh, I saw yeah. that thread. Yeah. Oh wow, people yelled at me so I much. I about didn't see. That. I didn't see what they yelled at you because I'm not. You know, I don't get notifications every time you get yelled at, but you do. <laughs> what the hell am I doing? I mean, you got to just let people yell. But no, they they did not like the comment about the hats. Those those hats were very beloved to many many sort of suburban resistance fighters against Trump. You know that that was. I don't know. Anyway, whatever. Who cares? Being yelled at is not the worst thing. But uh, but okay, so back to what I was saying. Democrats are diffuse. Uh, Republicans are cohesive. This is a big problem in our democracy. And it's not a problem that's going to be solved by reapportioning the Senate. You know, it's like, and that's why the Democrats have terrible messaging. Because you're like, you know, why do the Democrats have this weak ass messaging? It's because any message, any strong message they put out tends to offend one or another of their interest groups they can't offend. You know, they, they have people who, and, and yeah, there, there's, there's people who will be absolutely livid and will just scream at you all day if you trumpet the success of Tesla. They're like, well, why do you get, Tesla has all these billions of dollars. What about billions of dollars for the poor? Um, combined with the fact that no one really understands the relative amount of things that are budgeted for or like how much the government makes off of any of these things. And so, um, yes, someone said, uh, Anna said, Cohesive is great for attacking, not good for governance. That's they don't want to right. even govern. They don't want to govern. That's the whole no. point. No, they don't want to govern. attack they... and then render everything right. kind of inept. Yeah. I mean, they, yeah. they want their car dealerships to continue to make them enough money to live in a large single family home, drive around an SUV and wear some Crocs. As they, you know, and like, that's all they want. Like, they want the, all, the, all the annoying people to go away. All the annoying lives to go away. And shut up about you know, all the stuff like, I don't know, poverty or women's rights or some shit. <laughs> That's what they want. That's what the Republicans want. The Democrats really just don't want the Republicans to have power and screw them. But then as for what kind of world that they do want, it's very difficult. So you have to do a lot more with localism. I think that sort of the upshot of this whole rant is that is that California liberalism is going to look different than New York liberalism and different than Chicago liberalism and different than St. Louis liberalism. And that you're going to have that that if you want to build stuff in America, we've got the Biden administration did a great job coming up with tons of plans that you know didn't get passed and were difficult to implement. And we should still keep doing that. There's no reason not to keep doing that. But a lot of states are going to have to take it on themselves to to build and embrace federalism. That's my thought. Um, yeah, Anna. A note from a, from a Hungarian about what happens when you have a cohesive, very aggressive opposition that then makes it into power and how, how they actually stay there. Uh, one of the most interesting things that um, happened around um, the otherwise in every bit very scary and very interesting um, Fidesz phenomenon was the, the, their diversification after having gained power. So in, in terms of messaging, Fidesz is still extremely cohesive and retained a lot of their 
kind of warlike narrative that with which they um, uh, went into power, but their actual governance is extremely diverse. But it's diverse in a populist way, and so every time I, I hear this uh, differentiation between Democrats and Republicans, I'm like, okay, how how would a more successful and maybe ethical populism uh, look, um, and could that be mixed with um, with the diversity? Uh, Vivek. Hmm. Uh, yeah. Hi. So on Noah's point of, you know, this idea of very diffuse big tent um, uh, Democrats, uh, you know, versus this very highly focused um, Republican agenda, uh, you know, it seems to me that, you know, one answer, perhaps part of the answer is supply side progressivism. Uh, or, you know, whatever we're calling the new industrialism or um, essentially tying, um, you know, redistribution to, to increasing supply, uh, you know, uh, and no, no, I remember reading your um, Substack interview of Saika Chakrabarti of, uh, you know, who wrote the Green New Deal, right? Uh, or who was behind the Green New Deal. Uh, and he said, you know, he had two ideas behind, two goals behind it. One was to create a plan that the Democrat, Democratic candidates would have to respond to, creating pressure on them um, to respond to something. And the second one was introduce the idea that, you know, solving the climate crisis doesn't have to pit jobs against the climate, but making it actually just one project, which is, you know, a, a pro-growth uh, rather than an anti-growth uh, message. So do you think like that, message can can unite not, not unite the warring factions but essentially see that we all have to grow in order to get the goodies we want um you know so that seems to be like the story that ties the des disparate factions together and i just wanted to know your views on it you know i think that's that's what you got to do you have to do that um as for for shike out himself he lives down the street and we sometimes hang out um we, uh, Anna wants to do this thing where we walk around and like talk about stuff. Shai can't already do that. You just have to join us. Um, I want to do a walking salon and then we would go to the Marxist cafe that you recommended and oh, yeah. finish, finish the, uh, conclude the conversation with the, the red stars that are so reminiscent to me from my childhood. I don't know if they're even open right now. All right. But anyway, so, so what Shai Kat did, he, so, so, um, he now thinks that, that this attempt was largely a failure. Uh, you know, he's, he's glad that he got the idea of a big pro-growth climate plan into sort of democratic canon and that Biden eventually proposed something like that. So he doesn't think it's a complete failure, but he's frustrated by some of the outcomes. One of the outcomes that he's frustrated by was the idea that in building this movement, he built the Sunrise Movement, but then against his strenuous objections, they went with a local chapter structure and the local chapters of the Sunrise Movement are now trying to focus on the only things they can actually win, which is NIMBYism. Uh, so the, you have the local chapters of the Sunrise Movement engaged in NIMBY actions because that's the only environmentally-ish thing that they can actually win on. Say, oh, we won something, uh, you know. So in that sense, they're very much following in the uh, footsteps of their predecessor, the Sierra Club. The Sunrise Movement is like a, a new lefty environmental group that's destined to turn into the next iteration of the Sierra Club. And so that's one problem. Um, a second problem was that. Uh, the, if you looked at what the actual original Green New Deal had, it was it had some building stuff uh, involved in it, um, some infrastructure, but then that was dwarfed by the size of the the new you know social spending that it proposed. It was absolutely dwarfed by the call for like you know federal job guarantee, and basic income, and things like all this all this stuff you know universal health care. It was like that was like ten times as much as the actual investment, and so. Anyone, including Shaikat, about this, they would say, um, uh, they would say, well, we, we need to have an inclusive transition. We need to get people on board. But saying that you're going to spend untold trillions of unrealistic amounts on new social programs that actually swamp the actual environmental focus of the plan, they didn't even get anyone on board for that. It's like, it's like, we beclowned ourselves for popularity and didn't get the popularity. And it was poorly done. It was like, we, we, you know, we promised the moon because you've got to promise people things to get them on your side. 
how you get people on your side. You promise them things. And, you know, we, have, we have a very disparate coalition we need to unite, so let's just promise them the moon. And then it didn't unite the disparate coalition because in some sense, people realized that this was this was posturing, that this was that the promises were fake. There, there was no way the government would be able to carry out even one of these giant promises, much less all of them. Um, and so, and so that just really, uh, they went with the wrong strategy. They went with the wrong rhetorical strategy of of thinking that because they were naive, they, they were they were political newbies, and they thought that the way you get stuff is by making gigantic paper promises. Um, and then they didn't. And so I, I worry that that precedent could make people not believe in any sort of big new plans that uh, Democrats or progressives throw out. Is it really just the rhetorical strategy or just not having enough Senate seats? I mean, like we would have had something if we had another Senate seat. We would have had some type of climate plan with one more Senate seat. Yeah, that's right. Like I, maybe, and, and if, if we had one more Senate seat, anything about rhetorical policing wouldn't matter because we'd have some type of climate plan. So. Oh, no, you're, you're right, you're right. I'm talking about the 2019 thing. I'm, uh -huh. talking about, I'm talking about the original Green New Deal and how that just sort of went, went down the flames. Like I said, Shaikot is happy that he got the idea of a big climate and jobs and investment package into the sort of democratic panel. You know, like that was a success. That's good. You, they reoriented, to, you know, democratic policy ideas toward this idea of doing a big green investment package. And um, yeah, and in fact, that had been part of Obama's promise too. You know, Obama was all about the green jobs, but the idea of going much bigger than Obama would go. Um, anyway, so yeah, so I, I, I don't think it was a complete failure. I think there were failures involved with it that that Shaikot now sort of, you know, thinks he would do differently, but that doesn't mean the whole thing as a whole accomplished nothing. It accomplished something. Like, it's just, yes, but but because of mansion, it accomplished nothing. But then in the future, when we don't have a mansion, we may accomplish something better. Hopefully we won't all be dead by Well, then. it might be 10, you know, 10 plus years from now, if we're lucky. Hopefully um, we uh, David, you've been very patient. Sorry. Oh, no problem. Uh, I just I, I just wanted to sort of <laughs> I think my my main question last time was really about the sort of evidence or goal based uh, governance and I I just, you know should have probably put that as my one and only question um, cause I'm, I but it does sort of tie back like Noah had mentioned that um, you know he, you you believe that one of the main reasons that things aren't happening uh, the way we would hope is that the, the Democrats are too fractured. Um, and that, you know, if they could sort of be cohesive, that that might be a solution. Um, uh, I'm curious, like, do, does anybody else sort of think of evidence-based government as an important solution to this? Um, if not, why? And if so, like, how, how does, what are some ideas of how to actually make it happen? Like, if the, how could you, or, or if you don't think that's the answer, um, you know, how do you think you, how do you get, if, if, uh, like originally my, I had asked about, you know, whether you know, this, this problem of voters and their inability to sort of have a sophisticated understanding of certain things. And you know, it also, you mentioned that um, if the, if the D Democrats had a cohesive message that that could sort of overcome this problem. So how do you get the Democrats, if you, if that is the solution, how do you get the Democrats to have a cohesive message and how do you get it to be the message that I personally want it to be <laughs> or that you want it to be like how do we get the if like if that's the problem how do we solve it how do you what's the positive version of like here's what the problem is but you know we've been talking a lot about how, what is the what do you think is the solution how do we actually solve the, that problem well I've often said that between me and Kim Mike Cutler we know everything in the world but this is one of the ones that Kim knows and I don't so I'll refer the <laughs> question I mean, I, I don't think a one size fits all solution exists. I mean, I think in everything that I've ever worked on from an advocacy perspective, like you have to form an issue specific structure um, just because, I mean, there's just too many things happening in American political society to have like a cohesive agenda. I mean, I'm from an individual, I mean, are you asking what you can do as an individual or what, What? I mean, because like, cause, like uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, I. I pick, I, I pick specific issues I want to work on that no one else is working on. And then we build a team around them and then we fundraise for it. And then they build a legislative agenda. And then we make sure that legis legislative agenda, you know, gets picked up by legislators. And then, the, you know, like there's a whole process to it, but I don't have a one size fits all solution. 
I guess the, the if if you I, I wonder uh, Kim if you agree with Noah that like the Democratic Party being fractured is sort of the the main reason why. Uh, oh, I agree. You know, I, I, I agree. So if that's the case, like, do you have ideas of how? Like, if I personally think evident, like, if if we want to solve a problem, if we want to solve a problem first, you have to define like here's what the problem is, and then once you solve that, you can say like here's some solutions to the problem. Here's a solution that we agree to try. Like maybe that's what dem democracy is, right? Like here's the solutions, maybe not the ultimate best, but like, yeah. here's one that we all kind of agree, but that we actually agree on it and that we measure the outcome. Like in business, you would never, yeah, you know, yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, you I never, and we won't, we won't measure it and we won't change anything if, if it doesn't turn out the way we expected. You'd never do that in like anything other than sort of, you know, maybe politics. So like, how do you get politics or government or whatever that you think that the sort of the, the, whatever the, the power is that can do it, like how do we get them to to do that? And I, I don't mean like as an individual, but sort of as a more big picture, like- if Yeah, I mean, I, okay, I get like per, per no discussion, like I cannot, I cannot even take people, you know, hundreds of people in a room from California who are of different racial backgrounds and in, like, I can just cannot make them have the same perspective or like, I just can't. Even if I put them all in or, you know, like it just wouldn't, you know, like that's just who we, that's who the party is. But from an, from an issue specific point of view, if you want outcomes, there are definitely ways to do that. Like you pick, pick a lane, pick an issue that you want to focus on. Um, and, you know, you figure out, you do a lot of research and interviews uh, with people who are experts on the problem, whatever it is. And then you figure out what the legislative change that needs to happen and then you, you know, you find someone who's actually has domain experience either in the subject or um, in, in passing legislation or policy or implementing it. And then you get them to like spend all their time to focus on that. And then they build a team and then you build off the shelf like legislation that you hand to understaffed policy member, you know, whatever, like, and that's, the, there's a whole process to it. And then if you want outcomes, you like look at them, like for housing, like, okay, we've gotten as far as passing laws. Okay, we've passed laws that make it easier to split lots and to build ADUs and to build like mid-sized apartment buildings. And if we want to measure results from that, we would obviously look at like units built over time. Um, if I was to look at that, then I would know that, um, you know, while we have made certain things easier to do and more ministerial, like there are certain sets of laws, for example, that our state senator Scott Weiner has passed that made it, has made it easier for mid-sized apartment buildings with like at least 50% affordability to be built in California. Like there's there are things that you can measure where that that actually has outcomes. The other stuff that we've passed in the last two to three years, I don't, you know, it's too early to tell. And there's a lot of like noise in terms of where we are in terms of like funding for housing generally because of you know, what, you know, we were in recession or not, but like, I don't have, oh, sorry, an ADU is an accessory dwelling unit. It's like a, it's like a back row house. Like California has a lot of single family homes. And so a thing that is obvious to do in California is you allow people to build two homes on the same lot instead of one. Um, yeah. So, you know, like I, I, I don't have a holistic response because everyone is literally, I just cannot put, I, I could not put 200 people in the same room and say like, we, want to do, you know, we have the same experience of the world and we want the government to do the same thing for us. And it's, I just, I, I do agree with, no, it's just so much harder for the Democratic Party to do it than the Republican Party because it is like, like, you know, what percentage of America is still white and like how many of them are actually in the Republican Party versus the Democratic, like the Democratic Party is like very, very diverse. So I don't know, you know. Do you see hope anywhere? Like, where do you see hope? Like, it sounds kind of bleak, as Dylan would put um, it. And by the way, Dylan, your your cat is glorious. I uh, just wanted to let you. Oh, I mean, <laughs> where do you see hope? Oh, I mean, like, I know how to get. I mean, I know how to get stuff done on the stuff I want to move. Like, I know how to do that, and I feel confident in my ability to do that. For the the larger like picture about like American democracy and what happens in twenty twenty four, I am very concerned because there are so many structural. Um, there are so many structural issues that put um, the Democratic Party at a disadvantage. And I do have, you know, given the experience that I, you know, I felt like I went through as well, I don't know if it, you know, how everyone else is politically in this room, but like to go through what we went through in 2016 through 2020, I see a real risk of it happening again in 2024, but, but worse and more, um, more like, 
you know, fluent at how to actually pull something off, like what happened on January 6th. Um, so I, I, that, that is what I'm concerned about at the federal, level. but like on the stuff that I know how to do. And I like, I, I can, that I pay attention to on housing and actually like in the climate venture world, like there's a lot of really cool stuff happening. Like on the policy side, I might be really bleak, but actually on the like investing policy side, there is a lot, there are a lot of funds that have been raised. There are a lot of entrepreneurs that are working on it. There's a lot of science out there that is just very clear about what needs to be done. And we just need to, you know, prototype it and scale it. Um, so in that side, like when I look at that world, I'm pretty optimistic, but like federal politics wise, like are, you know, are we going to have the same level of democratic rights, you know, going forward that my generation enjoyed or my parents' generation enjoyed? I'm not so sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I was talking to someone about this the other day, but I write a lot less about American politics than I used to and a lot more about other things of uh, global poverty, um, uh, animals, issues in the effect of altruism world. And a large part of that is just, I, I see a vast darkness in the future of American politics and find it hard to like get up in the morning and, and write about that every day. Writing about global poverty is much less depressing in that like at least the trajectory is in the right direction. Um, like things are getting better rather than worse. I don't know, I'm a little more optimistic. Uh, well, so so what's interesting about the Democrats is that they're they're sort of, I would say diversity, not necessarily of uh, you know just as we typically think of it as like ethnic diversity, et cetera, but diversity in terms of like interests and viewpoints. That diversity within the Democratic Party is you know inhibits Democrats from getting things done even when they have permanent supermajority statuses in California. It's very difficult to get stuff done in California because. The suburbanite homeowners want some, you know, who are very good Democrats. I always vote Democrat, but they they have something very different from like, you know, like poor tenants and like the downscale suburbs. And anyway, the et cetera, et cetera. And so I think just, they're just the the diversity of interest, you know. Um, and there, there's a chicken and egg problem. We'd like to create a, a broad middle class where people have more of the same economic interests, but to do that requires policy that we don't have the uh, the will for necessarily. Then uh, you know, without that broad middle class to generate the will, so there's a little bit of a catch twenty two. I think this is why you end up seeing uh, war be the catalyst for for <laughs> successful policy changes. You see, World War II, the Civil War, and the Cold War were the three times when America actually built stuff when we could get some sort of policy consensus. The grand, uh, you know, the, the 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 high point of American building success was not World War II. It was the early Cold War when we thought we might have to do this again against the Soviets, but three times bigger this time. We didn't, and that was good. But we built the interstates, and we built, you know, un unfortunately built the suburbs, partly to defend ourselves from nuclear attack. But we built the, um, we built the interstates, and we built a whole bunch of stuff, and the whole like NIH and everything like that. Um, we did good. And so, so the reason why I'm op more optimistic than you, Dylan, about American domestic politics going forward is because I am more deeply pessimistic about the near future of war and global affairs. And so I think that while we may, you know, respond badly to international conflicts and we may reelect Trump and he may select, he may like support Putin and all this bullshit, it could be really bad, but there is a chance that international conflict, which is bad, will have the silver lining of generating more political unity in America as it did during the Cold War and World War II, which is good, but not good enough to make me happy about war. So if that's a nuanced position. I'm not happy about war, but maybe we can get some unity out of it here to respond to it. <laughs> um, Daniel, I wanted to give you a shot to jump in here. Oh, I, I have a, a different direction, I think. My question is mostly for Kim. So I'm in New York City and I live in Manhattan and a lot of what I do is working on getting people to focus on the city or the local government because the local government has a massive capacity to make New York City and by virtue of New York City, the United States much more abundant. Um, I was wondering what you do in your context to take people who have zero knowledge about local and maybe state mechanisms and take them from zero and move them to a point where they're sufficiently interested to engage. 
Yeah, I mean, you couple things. Um, I mean, it also depends on what demographic you're targeting because different demographics are, you I mean, you have to reach them in different ways, but like um, creating, um, you know, if you run an organization, you want to onboard people, like give them politics 101 sessions, make social events that they can go to social, I mean, out, I mean, social events where people can connect with each other. A lot of movements are, you know, people need to kind of think of it as a hobby or you have to get them to think about it as a fun hobby that they do together where they have friends in it. Um, I think like, uh, what was like, um, spacing on his name, but like the Harvard political professor that advised Obama, what's his name, the organizer? Uh, oh, Marshall Gans? Yeah, Marshall Gans. I wouldn't he have said something about the NRA and the NRA is effective because it's a social club. So you kind of create a social club or a social environment where people feel bonded to each other and want to go and do regular things with each other, whatever that is. And then you create onboarding sessions, um, have a voter guide, you know, raise money to send it out to as many people as possible, like, and, and just do it like a habit, like a thing that you do normally and regularly, that's, that's something that people can go to on an expected regular basis. And that's how people form bonds and start to like, do things like encourage each other to turn on vote. Yeah, sounds like a church. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. 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 Well, and I think this is this is something my friend Danny Schlossman, who's a, a political scientist who studies sort of like the old days of party bosses a lot, um, tell, tells me a lot about that. That like when you went to a Tammany Hall party, like it was a party, like there was there was booze everywhere. They fed you dinner. It was like a genuinely good time. And uh, and it's very especially pre mass literacy. It's it's much easier to get people involved um, if you can offer them that kind of community um and yeah so i kim has done a lot more of this kind of work than i have but i, I think that's all completely right you have to make it fun and like a fun hobby mm-hmm. um yeah i would I'll, also say i mean even but i would also counter that like there's different strategies for different outcomes like in california like the grassroots I mean obviously it's great to have grassroots supporters and voters but like in terms of actually making real policy change in California it's like having a really you know a very focused staff in Sacramento like supporting and championing legislation there would be more important than like grassroots socials but it's obviously depends on like what level of government you're playing at and what election you're playing at and what outcomes you want like so you kind of have to tailor it to the outcome that you're hoping to get, I, you know, like, I don't know whether your outcome is more focused on like the council or like, you know, some type of deliverable from a different part of the city government where it's more focused on bureaucrats that are non-elected. So, I mean, you just have to think about like the outcome that you want and kind of work backwards from there. All right. Um, any any other thoughts from um, uh, from guests here? Uh, we also we're we're almost at the hour, and so I, I uh, my guest or a host? You're uh, you're a panelist. You're a distinguished a pa- okay, panelist. Panel. But yeah. if you have thoughts, I want to hear them. I have I have uh, one thought, one remaining thought, which is um, we need that the one thing that I have not heard much of in recent years. And the last I heard of it was Obama's campaign in, in, uh, you know, 2008. Uh, You know, I I worked on that campaign a little bit as a volunteer and would go around, I would listen to Obama's speeches and stuff. And since then, I haven't heard much concrete vision articulation. I think that there is room for vision articulation at the, at the national politician level, of course, maybe Biden's not the right guy for that. We need somebody who can do that because we didn't have, like, Bernie Sanders had a vision and it didn't get much support. You know, it wasn't wasn't a vision a lot of people bought into. And really, not many other people had a vision. You know, Elizabeth Warren had a list of things she was mad at, but I was mad at too. But you know, and um, you know, Kamala Harris has no vision. And so so we need a vision at the national level, but we also need visions at the local level. You know, if we're gonna do federalism and localism, we need visions for what the future of the Bay Area could look in terms of housing and transit. We need visions for you know, what um, 
for, for what a better healthcare system would look like. Um, and those visions exist. We need, we need people to sell the future, to sell these visions much more. So if you're a rich person, I don't know if anyone here is like really rich and looking to contribute to stuff, maybe not, but, but if I were talking to rich people, um, then um, I would say fund people who can create and push visions. And um, I mean, it could be as simple as something like, uh, you know, Kim, of course, you know, uh, Alfred Twu. Uh, you know, he, he draws these amazing pictures of what city blocks, dense, dense city blocks could look like and still look nice in America. It looks amazing. And, uh, you know, so just fun stuff like that. Um, that's like a, a minor example, but also, you know, fun people who talk about the visions, fun people who, who write them down, authors who write them, even artists who draw them, and then politicians who say them, we need more, we need more vision. Anyway. Yeah, I mean, I think maybe that's, that's something for our, our last act here to think about is, um, I agree in that, that, that federalism is kind of the future of, of all progressivism supply side or otherwise, and not because it's a natural place for it, but because there is no alternative. <laughs> Uh, in the United States in the in the near term, um, but uh, it's it's not a great track record. Like um, uh, California does not, to me, in t send a message to the rest of the country that if you pay more taxes and and live in a more left leaning society, the government will do more things for you in a better way. Um, on the margins, maybe like that you expand Medicaid, that matters a lot. But uh, but you you would really want sort of the uh, the exemplars, the states doing this, to be very well governed, efficient, um, sort of attractive places for people to to go to. And right now, they're either completely unaffordable or um, they it feels like they can't execute on fairly basic um, policy things and so i don't really have a strategy there like whenever i talk to friends who live in california i say like you guys should just junk your state constitution and write a new one because it's completely broken but uh it's very easy for me as a non-californian to just like jump in and say that <laughs> um and i i don't know if if tim or, or noah as actual californians have more uh more of a vision for what it would look like to turn california into like the, the Sweden of the United States or, or like a similarly well-governed um, sort of institution. I mean, we'd have to fix a lot of ballot initiative. I mean, like, we I don't know, the, the ballot initiative thing is pretty, I don't know if you've been following this, but like there was a LEO report on the GAN limit the other week you know, saying, cause so our state is really, we had our state reported like a hundred billion dollar surplus this year. And that's because the state is heavily dependent on capital gains, um, tax revenue. And as you know, there was a crazy stock market last year. Hence there's a lot of capital gains revenue, which led to a hundred billion dollar surplus. But then there's this like 1979 GAN limit, um, that, you know, says that when, you know, the, the, the budget grows by more than some, I don't know the specific level, like we have to refund that money to taxpayers. And then on top of that, there's been various um, initiatives passed that say that like 40% of the spend has to go to schools and X percent has to go to Y and, you know, and there's all these like different spending requirements. And so when you stack them all together and put them together like a layer cake, you know, whenever we have a huge surplus, I think we have to spend like $1.60 for every dollar that we get in. And so it's like, um, it's just not, and that, that's because of all this, these, these, these voter initiatives passed over the many years. And so it puts the government in an impossible situation. And I think you have to start to like untangle those to actually have, you know, any type of meaningful kind of legislative discussion. And, you know, I also know, you know, like, I, I think this is more relevant today than it was pre pandemic, but like, you know, I do think that the relative tax you know, the context of California being a state within California, like the relative tax differences are going to matter. I think they are going to matter more going forward, particularly for people start companies and start big companies that would be big, you know, uh, payer payers. Like if you, your entire workforce can be remote, like why, I don't understand why they would pay like the additional 13% here. I mean, not, not to like be, you know, like I'm a Californian, fourth generation Californian, but I do, do think for a lot of um, payers, 
who would have been here before because of the network effects um, that can now be fully remote. Like, I don't, I, I don't, yeah, I think a lot of them are gonna question like the premium. No, no. Are you a, a an optimist or a doomer on California? Uh, California, you know, took a lot of things for granted that now it is gonna not get to enjoy. And <laughs> California is gonna undergo some difficult times as it learns that, you know, sunshine and history of industrial clusters is not invincible. You know, route to like higher home prices forever and like higher state tax revenues forever. So. <laughs> Um, anyway, uh, there will be a big shakeout. A lot of people will get mad. And then at some point, at some, the, the one thing that needs to happen is you need a, you need a, some sort of credible opposition. You need either the Democrats fracture, fracture into two factions that actually fight each other, as they sort of do in San Francisco, but haven't really at the state level, or you need, um, Republicans to come back and, you know, stop clinging to like the last ghosts of like 1980s era you know racism and like actually make a you know sort of like pro-business uh you know sort of like ronald reagan-esque republicanism arnold schwarzenegger-esque republicanism that actually can they can actually appeal to latinos and then either one of those will be fine and that will get some real competition going um, after California learns that it can't just coast. Uh, yeah, Vivek. Uh, so <clears throat> this totally, like I, I had this, I, you know, a uh, question I wanted to ask all three of you um, and really anyone, uh, you know, and Noah's last comment really precipitated it even more. Uh, which is what do you, so for each of you, what is a vision? Like, what would you like to see? Like, uh, you know, um, uh, paint us a picture, right? What would you like to see in the next, I don't know, five years, maybe in the next 10 years, or, you know, really even, even, even beyond that, um, you know, uh, that, that really inspires you. Um, do you want to start Kim and then, then Noah and then uh. me? Maybe, maybe you first, I don't know. Maybe me first. Um, I'm, I'm worse at describing utopias than describing problems. Um, and uh, there's, there's a reason people don't like writing utopian novels, that it's, though it's boring when there aren't problems. Um, I guess in terms of, I, I would like for there to be a, like a national culture of by right construction of certain things. Um, and I, I don't know how we get there, but like you want to build a giant carbon removal plant in the middle of Montana, you can. And they're, they're, it is very difficult for someone to stop you. Uh, you want to turn a, a single family block in San Francisco into a, a set of like six story apartment buildings. Fantastic. You can do it. Uh, no one can stop you and people will be mad and people will will rant on next door um and but there's there's a general sense of uh you're allowed a presumption that you're allowed to do things um and i think beyond that like i would like the state to become a lot more entrepreneurial and uh and and would like uh people who want to build new exciting things, especially physical things, to feel like there are places where they can easily and re reliably go for money to try the, that out. And um, so, yeah, whether that's like two, three, many ARPAs or whatever it looks like, um, if someone has like a really good, uh, <laughs> this is not the best example, but I, uh, I finally, years and years later, got around to reading John Kerry's book on um on Theranos and the thing I kept thinking in it was like imagine for a moment that these people weren't criminals <laughs> and that you were actually trying to just like make a much better blood testing device that would be absurdly hard <laughs> and and a lot of 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 the sort of issues of like initial startup capital and investment and years of prototyping and stuff 
that would uh that would be real um so like maybe one way to phrase this wish is i i would hope that if someone ever does figure out how to do blood tests with just a drop of blood that they have the resources they need to do that uh assuming they are not like literally a fraud <laughs> Maybe you know yeah. him. Oh, me? Um, I don't know. Um, so, I mean, you know, I'm in the in the years to come, I'm going to focus on my value add, which is dishing out bullshit. I mean, ideas, ideas. Uh, so I, I'm going to focus on like trying to solidify the kind of intellectual case around uh, the abundance agenda, supply side, whatever you know, whatever you want to call it. And then there's going to be multiple of those. So just, the, you know, including all the flavors. So just bolstering the intellectual case of like, what, what we need more of, you know, et cetera. And then, and then ideas on how to get it. Uh, but, and then also networking, you know, getting people to talk to each other. And so those are kind of my value adds at this point as a, um, as a blogger. Uh, and so then, you know, I can think about other things to do. Uh, but I think at this, at, at this point, that's what I can do. Um, yeah, in terms of in terms of what other people need to do, I'm let I'm sort of just like it's. Some, I, I need to see more successful examples. Uh, I mean, obvious. I think that I, I guess what I'd say is that um, ultimately, this movement is going to be a national outgrowth of the California Yimby movement. That the Yimbys are who started this idea. They are the, they are the people who from whom this came. Um, and that it wasn't really the Green New Deal people, it was the Yimbys, although often those are the same people, you know, it's like they, they all hang out. But um, that, that sort of revolt against scarcity is building. And I think that you see, you're already starting to see major echoes of it in Democratic Party rhetoric, but I think that uh, you know, when when Republicans start trying to like one up the Democrats by getting their own versions of abundance, uh, you know, um, then then we'll really be in business because that's how that's how revolutions happen. I, I, policy revolutions, I think they they happen. So, so a little bit of of like sort of bullshit, you know, his like pocket history here. Um, Herbert Hoover began some of the things that would eventually become the New Deal, a few of them, although he half-assed he half -assed it and he had a bad attitude about it, but he began some of those things. And much of the most important things were done by Eisenhower and Nixon, Republicans. So Republicans trying to grab the Democrat popular New Deal energy, trying to triangulate that, ended up pushing the ball forward policy-wise quite a lot, making sure the EPA, uh, you know, um, and OSHA, you know, whatever you think of those, um, he, he created those. And then Eisenhower built the interstates, blah, 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 blah. And then on the other side, you saw that the Reagan revolution was actually much more done by Carter and by Clinton than by Reagan himself. You know, Carter did all this deregulation and appointed Volcker. And then, you know, who slaughtered uh, inflation and put all the, the entire Midwest out of a job. Um, and then Clinton came in and, you know, ended welfare and deregulated the financial system. Uh, which eventually caused a giant crash, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so, and, and even did austerity. Clinton did, uh, you know, balance the budget. And so the Reagan, re the Reagan revolution was done just as much by Democrats, really, policy-wise, trying to triangulate. And that's when you win. So you need, so I think we should start with the Democratic Party. We need to give the Democratic Party an agenda, a new New Deal kind of agenda that is actually popular enough to win instead of just like a whole bunch of paper moon promises, but actually an agenda that's popular enough to win. Um, it's going, and that, and that Yimbyism is the first thing I've seen that can generate such a broad agenda. Everyone needs a place to live. Um, that's exactly what Kim told me when I first came to San Francisco and she invited me out to some like a hipster bar on market. Do you remember that? Went out with, uh, with Laura. Yeah, I don't uh, remember that. <laughs> There's so long, so many things have happened. I can't remember them all, so. You know, when I first came to San Francisco, you you yeah. were like, "Hey, want to hang out?" Back in 2016, yeah. and so yeah. like anyway, um, yes. And then you invited me to a party where everyone was supposed to preach their own new religion they made up, only to yeah. spend the entire time preaching Yimbyism to me. <laughs> so 
So you won that party. <laughs> yeah, so, so that... um, ultimately, I would like to say that Kim Mai Cutler's long uh, tech wrench article <laughs> ultimately changed, you know, gave was the spur for a new democratic agenda that took over the entire country and changed our country. Um, that will be an exaggeration, but I will write that after the fact. Okay. That's our, that's our best chance is, is that. We need to extend the MBism to other stuff. We need to extend it to healthcare and jobs and technology and things like that. And um, that's better. Focusing on those goals is, is the way to do it because focusing on, because Yimbyism has succeeded because it was like, just do housing, give us some houses, get the houses. And then like, you know, everyone's always like, oh, but we, we got to do it with public housing and not with deregulation market rate. Shut up. Do it all. Do it all. Do it all. And so like <laughs> that, that sort of like do it all thing is the true success of FDR. Because FDR is like, God damn it. I'm going to get these people some jobs. <laughs> <laughs> that's like that's what he was about he, he didn't care if he had to form like business cartels or like social insurance to do it he was going to do it some way that's what we're going to do and we just have to extend that to more goals we know housing is a goal now we just need five things instead of one thing um healthcare jobs and technology or other things and and human dignity how about human dignity anyway <laughs> so, uh, abundance of dignity see now i'm now i'm starting to write manifestos in my head <laughs> That's really what we need to do is just is just I, maybe not dignity. Get the goals and then go and then go for the goals by whatever means we can. Do it all. And that's what I think is gonna win. And that's what that that's the attitude that can overcome the fractious divisions of the Democrats and create something because everybody wants a place to live. Everybody wants to be able to get health care when they need it. Everybody wants some sort of a job. Anyway. Yeah. Hundred hundred percent. I agree with that. So you're asking like, where do I feel, where do we feel inspired or where like? No, just really, what, what would you like to see? Um, yeah, I mean, I like, I, I mean, on the housing front, I think, I mean, I think, I mean, there's actually been a lot of writing. I, there's been a lot of writing about this um, recently about like housing being included in measures of inflation. But I, I mean, I think, it, I think, we act as a country need a slightly different attitude towards housing. Like it can't be this thing. Like if it goes up seven, eight, 10, 20 percent a year, which is these are all ranges that it's appreciated in the last few years, like and wages are not moving at the same pace. Just a general understanding that that is structurally bad and we should have more of an attitude that housing should rise in line with wages and inflation so that like or you know, not not faster than it because we don't want this compounding problem of more people, you know, not being able to afford housing. And I think the zoning conversation and the supply current conversation is downstream of that. Um, it, you know, it's more symptomatic of of, of the latter. Um, so I think that cultural understanding is really really important. Um, in terms of healthcare, I, I mean. I, I've, I've been a, you know, a user of how their countries' healthcare systems. And I'm just, you know, I have, I mean, I don't know in what instance or when, you know, the equivalent of a Medicare care for all will ever exist in the United States, but like, we're the only country that doesn't have it. Uh, we're one of the only countries that doesn't have some type of universal healthcare access in, in an industrialized society, um, which is ridiculous. Um, and then, um, I thought, I mean, the most important part of BBB for me was simply the climate part because it was so time sensitive. And so we, I don't like, I don't, I mean, like it's May, it's mid-May. Like, I, I don't know. I mean, like that, I think that was our, I mean, as, as um, you know, it, it, you know, that was our shot for the next 10 years. So I'm, I, I don't know. I mean, like, and like Nancy Pelosi didn't seem to prioritize it or think it was important at this Aspen Climate Conference this past week, um, but that that was that was it. That that was it. Like we're not going to get another shot at that. And then in ten years, the problem is going to be much worse. Um, so I'm not sure what to do there other than make California's offsets market better. <laughs> And then invest in more climate entrepreneurs. I, I do think the climate entrepreneurship is seen right now is really, it is really inspiring. I mean, there's a, like, 
I think there's a lot of energy and optimism and positivity right now there just because there's like so many big funds that were raised in the last year or two. And so the capital is there, at least for the initial parts. That said, like what everyone is building is just going to be a real slog, like building your carbon removal plan in Montana, like just getting all those pieces of regulation in order to make that happen, like that is going to, it's not just one thing and it's not just the zoning. Cause like a lot of these methods usually have like, they might have a byproduct, like a bio oil or, you know, a byproduct that needs to be stored somewhere. And then the quantity and size that it needs to be stored, you need to like, are you, are we going to have to like pipe it somewhere or is it going to be dug into the ground? And like, you know, what communities are going to oppose that? Like, there's a lot of, a lot of moving pieces there that like people haven't figured out. So like the optimism is there, but like the, the regulatory and scaling piece um, is going to be a lot of work, but like, there's a lot of positive energy happening there. And I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about that. Um, I do think like, I'm, I'm also very interested in like wildfire as a wedge issue. Um, I mean, obviously Republicans have been climate denialists for many, many decades, but I do think the wildfire issue is kind of an interesting avenue because it will affect so many red states in the West. It is like, like Utah, Montana, and like, I wonder from a political basis, like if there's a way to kind of turn that into a, is, is there a way to, for that to be kind of like the, the like pill, the red pill into climate or something for the, I don't know, you know, I, I don't know how to think about that, but I'm, I know that like, to me, it, it doesn't seem like red states are going to be like, no, we don't want to, you know, address the wildfire problem, which is clearly and obviously an outgrowth of like climate, you know, emissions. Anyway, so that's my that's my thinking right now. That's fantastic. Um, we're a little over, um, so I, I think Anna and I are going to wrap things up. But thank you so much to Noah and Kim um, for for coming, and thanks to all of you for joining us. Uh, this was this was a lot of fun.